And now it's my pleasure to introduce our first presenter. Nicole Smith, who was born and raised in New Brunswick, has a MA in dispute resolution from the University of Victoria. She is a qualified mediator with the ADR Institute of Canada and is also a certified coach. As the owner of Nicole Smith Conflict Management, Nicole has provided workplace conflict management services to government departments, Indigenous community organizations, academic institutions, nonprofits, and more nonprofits and more all across the province. Nicole has worked in the field of workplace conflict management for 10 years and is passionate about fostering positive, compassionate workplace cultures. Nicole is also the co-chair of MMFC's Workplace Violence and Abuse Research Team. Alors, juste pour euh, vous faire souvenir, les participants peuvent aussi opter pour l'interprétation simultanée en utilisant le menu déroulant en bas à gauche de leur écran. So, now over to our first presenter, Nicole Smith, for her presentation on de-escalating customers and clients. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. Good morning, Angela. And thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, and welcome this morning, everyone, to de-escalating customers and clients. I'm going to share my screen with you. There we go. So this morning, we're going to talk about de-escalating customers and clients. So what are we talking about when we talk about situations where clients and customers need to be de-escalated? It's situations where someone is angry or yelling or making a scene in your workplace. So why do people escalate? It could be that they're having a bad day. It could be that you are the last straw after they've bottled up their feelings all day. Maybe they have been holding everything in all day and you just happen to be the person that's getting the brunt of that explosion. It might be that you, for whatever reason, are triggering past experiences or bad experiences for them. Or it might be that exploding and, and escalating in a workplace works for them. You know, whether they're aware of it or intentionally doing it or not, it might be that throwing a tantrum in your workplace has gotten them what they want in the past, either in another place or in your workplace itself. But what it comes down to is the why is not that important. It's because the strategies for handling someone who's escalated, someone who's losing it in your workplace are going to be the same no matter what the reasons for why they're doing it. So today I'm going to teach you the CAR model for de-escalation. C is for calm, A is for assess, and R is for resolve. In any escalated situation, you want to calm the person down, assess what are your options for resolution, and then put those options into, into action to resolve the situation. The hardest piece of the model, and the one we're going to spend 99% of our time on this morning, is calm. We are, the A and the R to assess and resolve are so much easier to do that we often jump right over calm and go straight to them. And it's logical to think that if we resolve the situation for someone, they're going to calm down. But that's just not how our human brain works. And I want you to think about that in a different context. How often are we venting at home? We go home from a bad day of work and we're venting and we say to our partner, our spouse, you know, all the trouble we're having in the workplace and they jump in with solutions. They jump in with problem solving right away. What's the thing that we typically say to them? I want you to put in the chat, what's the thing that we typically say to our partner when they jump in right away with solutions? You don't get it. I just want you to listen. Already tried that. I want to ignore it. It's not that bad. I'm not looking for a solution. I just want you to listen. Absolutely. How often do we essentially say to them, I don't want you to solve it for me. I just want you to listen to me. 
Well, whether they realize it or not, the person who's escalated in our workplace is feeling the same way. They just want us to listen to them. One of the other reasons that we tend to jump over calm and go straight to assess or resolve is because we already typically know the resolutions to their problems. We already typically know what are the parameters with which we can give a refund to somebody. We already know what it is that we um, what it is we can do for them if their shipment didn't show up. We already know who within our organization we can call to get that answer. We want to jump in and give them those answers because we already know them. The problem is when someone is escalated, when they're yelling at you, when they're losing it in your workplace, they're not in a place where they can actually hear those resolution options you're giving them. We need to get them to a place where they can hear us before we move into assess and resolve. And all of that comes down to calm. So I want you to tell me, how good do you think you are at calming people down? If you go to your chat box, um, where you put in your chat, there's a little happy face in the right corner. I want you to click on that happy face and it'll give you a list of emojis. I want you to pick an emoji that represents how good you feel you are at calming people down. We've got one happy face, which is great. <laughs> we've got some sad faces. We've got some squiggly eyes. We have one exploding head. Ooh, one poop emoji. I think that this is a really great indication that where we are as far as calming people down can be a mixed bag. Some of us have a natural skill at it. Some of us don't feel like we do. And everyone's in the middle between those two. And so I want to talk about, as I said, I want to take 99% of our time today and talk about how do we calm someone down when they're escalated in our workplace? So I said that it's logical to think that if we resolve the situation for somebody, they're going to calm down. But that's not how the brain works. When someone is escalated in our workplace, when if someone is escalated in any situation, they have gone into a fight, flight, or freeze response. Usually it's called the fight or flight response. And that fight, flight, or freeze response is your body's evolved response to danger. It allows our brains to recognize danger and to take over our physical reaction to protect us. And when it was originally evolved, it was protecting us from things like being chased by a bear. But now in the complex world we live in, in the complex social dynamics we exist in, our brain can't necessarily tell the difference between a fight in the workplace or an emotional conversation and being chased by a bear. So our brain and our body react the same to both. So for the person who's yelling at the fast food employee because there was an item missing from their, from their order, they are having a fight, flight, or freeze response. And if they're someone who has escalated in the workplace, they're having a fight response. So they have gone into that workplace and they have, for whatever reason, decided it's dangerous for them. And before the smart thinking, logical part of their brain can catch up, the animalistic part of their brain in the back has recognized danger and has gone into action, has triggered a fight response. And that switch has meant that their brain has taken over and started flooding them with hormones. It is telling their heart to pump faster and stronger in order to fill their limbs with blood in case they need to pump, or sorry, in case they need to fight. It has spiked their adrenaline, which is why sometimes when you're dealing with someone like that, you can see them shaking. And the worst part for us in those situations is that it has taken them from this logical thinking part of their brain into the emotional part of their brain. So this is the escalation cycle. And if someone is moving from triggered and agitated and accelerated, their fight response is going off. And when they're in that red box you can see on your screen, they can't hear you. Anything you say to them is going 
completely unthought about in that front part of their brain. So you need to move them down that peak. You need to get them into de-escalation before they can even physically hear and think about the things that you're saying to try and solve the problem for them. So I want you to think about that red dot between agitation and acceleration. That is when they're standing at your counter or in front of your desk, just about to explode. So how do we calm someone down? The first thing we have to do is we have to keep ourselves in check. If that person, for whatever reason, has seen themselves as being in danger and has gone into a fight, flight, or freeze response, you, who is being yelled at, are also going to go into a fight, flight, or freeze response. You're also going to see yourself as being in danger. So the most important thing you can do is keep yourself from going into that fight, flight, or freeze response. So I want you to think about which of those three responses is most common for you. Do you get defensive and angry? Do you heat up and shake? That's a fight response. Do you panic? Do you even cry? Do you try desperately to you know, escape to another room? That's flee. Flight, I guess, sorry. Or do you feel shocked? Do you go numb? Do you feel frozen in a place? That's a freeze response. So I want you to think about a time when you have experienced someone escalating in your workplace. Maybe you work for a government program and you have a client who suddenly started you know, yelling and uh, threatening to call their MP or their MLA. Maybe you are um, work for, maybe you have an online business and you've gotten an all caps email response from someone who you've just had to tell you can't give a refund to. I want you to think about a situation like that. And if you're someone who's been lucky enough not to experience something like that in your workplace, I want you to think about what it is that, is what you think of a situation like that in your personal life. And I'm going to give you a couple of moments to think about it and to decide which of those three responses you typically go into. I see Isabel has already shared with us that she gets really confused. Isabel, that is more than likely a freeze response. If you feel confused, it's because your brain is just stopped. <laughs> Yeah, so we've started, I, before I even ask, before I even ask, you guys are great. I was gonna ask, if you feel comfortable, share what your typical response is. We're getting some freeze. I've got a freeze emoji, which is great. We're hearing that people uh, get defensive, which is your fight. Freeze, flight, fight, being a real mixture. I saw someone say that their response can be different in different places. That is absolutely possible. I know for me, when I am in a work situation, um, I often go into a, if I get triggered in a work situation, I will go into flight. I try to get out of there as quick as possible. But if I'm in a personal situation and I'm triggered, I tend to go into freeze. I feel unable to think. I just sort of stand there dumbly. And so we can absolutely have different responses. So. What you need to do is you need to work on moving out of that response. You need to be aware of what your response typically is in order to help yourself not go into that response immediately when someone escalates in your workplace. So what are some other ways that we can try to calm someone down? So firstly, keep ourselves calm. Secondly, we wanna project a calm body language. If someone is in fight mode, they are gonna be more aware of our body language than they are of the words that we're saying, not intentionally or necessarily in their you know, conscious awareness, but their brain, which is identified danger, is gonna be looking for more signs of danger. So it's gonna be listening to your tone of voice. It's gonna be watching your body language. So you need to respect their personal space, which also is a way of keeping yourself at a safe distance. You wanna keep your expression and your body posture neutral. You wanna always maintain a polite tone of voice. You wanna use a normal volume when you speak. 
You want to let your arms hang at your side. I know it's going to be tough, but you want to try not to cross your arms. One thing that I also see people do is people will hold themselves closed. They're not necessarily crossing their arms defensively, angrily defensively, but they'll hold themselves closed. And as much as that is our instinct, you want to let your arms hang at your side if you can. And you want to maintain an appropriate level of eye contact. And when I say an appropriate level of eye contact, I mean, you don't want to stare at them in the eye. That's going to make anyone uncomfortable in any situation. But you want to keep some eye contact, you know, intermittently to let them know that you're listening. And speaking of listening, that's the third thing that you're going to want to do in order to calm someone down. When I, so working in workplace conflict resolution, people will often sort of ask me, what's the magic sauce? What's the magic wand to conflict management? And I always tell them that it's listening. So here are some bad listening habits. I'm gonna call them out one by one. And I want you to put in the chat, what's the good listening habit that responds to that? So if the bad listening habit is listening to respond, I will, Chantel says, I will listen until the person stops talking. Great. I hope that you're actually listening and listening and not just listening until they stop so you can put your piece of information in. Absolutely. Listening openly, listening to understand. When it comes to listening to respond, the better thing to do is you need to listen to understand, listen to hear them. When, if the bad listening habit is asking unnecessary questions, What's the good listening habit? Being curious, absolutely. Letting them lead the conversation, absolutely. One thing that I find, listening to truly understand the issue, absolutely. One thing that I find is I have to stop myself from asking the questions that are the little details. Oh, who was it who said that? Oh, what was their name? Oh, was that Tuesday? Those are the things that when you're dealing with someone who's escalated, you don't need to know. If you need to know those details later, you can ask them later when that person is calm. But for now, you wanna focus on asking open-ended questions. You wanna focus on letting them talk, letting them feel heard. If the bad listening habit is dismissing their feelings, what's the good listening habit? Catherine has put, you must feel like, dot, 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 absolutely. Acknowledging their feelings, asking how they feel, absolutely. You don't want to dismiss someone's feelings, you want to acknowledge their feelings. If you have someone come into your workplace who's angry, who's upset, who says that the last person was dismissive and rude or uh, uh, mean to them, you don't want to say, oh, that was Jane. I'm sure she wasn't. I'm sure you were just overreacting. You want to hear them. You want to acknowledge that feeling. You want to say that that must have been really frustrating for you to come in and feel like someone was being rude. You want to understand their feeling. Absolutely. The next bad listening habit is using humor to deflect. What's the danger of using humor in an escalated situation? Making them angrier, absolutely. You never want to risk making the situation more escalated. Making them think that you're not taking them seriously, trivializing the situation. They'll feel like you're minimizing their anger. Absolutely. You need to remember that this is someone who is currently not thinking with the logical part of their brain. They're reacting to your tone of voice. So if your tone of voice is frivolous, is minimizing, that's what they're going to hear. You want to only use humor with that person if they're using humor. You want to let them lead you in that. What about continuing to work when they come in? If the bad listening habit is continuing to work, what's the good listening habit? Attention. Absolutely. What's the good listening habit? What else do you think you could do instead of continuing to work? Absolutely. Stop your work. Put your work down. If you're ringing through customers, stop ringing through customers. If you're answering emails, stop answering emails. Let them know that you are their full attention. 
Don't look at your phone. Don't look at the screen. If the bad listening habit is to jump to process or policy, you desperately want to tell them that your refund policy is A, B, and C. But that you know that's a bad listening habit. What's the good listening habit? Pay attention to only them. What do you think the good listening habit is instead of jumping straight to policy and process? Focus on the calm part to get to the solution. Absolutely, be in the moment with them. If they're still in that red box on the escalation scale, on the escalation process, they're not in a position where they can hear what your return policy is yet. You can tell it to them. It's gonna go in one ear or the other. It's gonna go into deaf ears. So you want to stay within the calm part. So only after you calm them down. What about if you want to jump to resolution? Same, only after you calm them down. Absolutely. The thing about it is, as I said at the very beginning, our natural habit is to try to resolve the situation and get them out the door as quick as possible. You want to end that interaction. And ending that interaction in a positive way isn't necessarily going to get you that quickest get them out the door. You've got to go through the step of calming them down. So the biggest thing that you want to do is you want to focus, focus, focus on calming them down. In the end, it's 99% of the work of de-escalating someone. So what do you say to someone? who is escalated in your workplace. What do you say to them when you're trying to calm them down? First things first, you have to apologize. Even if you don't want to apologize, it is the culturally acceptable or culturally expected thing to do in a customer facing employment situation. So if you're doing customer service or program work or you have clients, the expectation is from that person who is escalated that you're going to apologize. Apologizing doesn't mean that you agree with them or that you think they're right, or that you acknowledge any wrongdoing. But you might feel like, um, I see a question, Felicia says, how do we balance potential verbal abuse while they vent during the calm phase? Actually, I'm gonna to get to that at the very end of this screen. So thank you, Felicia. You might feel bad for them having gone through that experience. You might feel bad that they didn't get the product that they expected. You can apologize for those things. I'm sorry that your parcel didn't arrive on time. I'm sorry you had a bad experience in here on Friday. I'm sorry that your order was incorrect. You wanna use the person's name if you can. Do you know their first name? Is it appropriate in your workplace to use their first name? Then use it. If it's not appropriate and you know their last name, Mr. or Ms. and then their last name. One thing that happens when we use someone's name is it starts to almost wake up that front part of the brain. So I don't know if you've ever experienced that feeling of talking to someone and talking with something and all of a sudden they say your name and it almost clicks something in your brain for you. It's moving them towards being calmer. You wanna ask them to, or you can ask them to move with you out of the crowd. You never, ever, ever wanna ask an escalated person in your workplace to go somewhere private. You want to keep yourself safe. So you don't necessarily want to say, if you're in a store and you have a private back room, you don't necessarily want to say, come into the back room with me. But you might say, as I've got up here, Miss Jones, would you step down the counter with me and I'll see if I can help you. You want to move them maybe away from the crowd so you can handle it calmly. And that then allows your other coworkers, if you're not alone in the workplace, if you have other coworkers to continue working with the other customers and clients that are there. And in response to Felicia's question, you want to answer their questions selectively. You want to ignore the rude questions and only answer the information seeking questions. So if somebody's saying, why are you so dumb? That's not a question you're going to answer. But if someone, you know, as I've got here, why are all teachers such jerks? Why do I have to follow these stupid rules? You're not going to answer the first question, but to the second question, you might calmly say, the school rules are there to keep students safe. You always want to answer politely, even when their question is asked rudely. 
Now to Felicia's question, if their question, if they are getting, or and even I see Melissa has says that's a good question. Should we let them say everything? If someone is becoming abusive, if you feel unsafe, if they are swearing, if they're becoming physically aggressive, banging on things, anytime you start to feel like it is getting overly abusive or it is getting like abusive or unsafe, you have a right to then say to that person, I need you to stop swearing at me. If you do not stop swearing at me, I cannot continue this conversation with you. I need you to stop banging on the table. I would like to help you. If you continue banging on the table, I cannot continue this conversation with you. Now, yes, if they're still escalated, if they're not calm, that's not necessarily gonna make the situation calmer in that it's not moving them down the escalation scale, but you still have to keep yourself safe. You still have to keep your coworkers safe. So it's not gonna necessarily de-escalate the situation, but it's also gonna hopefully stop them from banging, stop them from being abusive. If it doesn't, then, and this isn't something that I've gone into much in this presentation, simply because of our time constraints, but there is a point where you have to say, this person is not being, uh, this person is unsafe in my workplace. This person is being unsafe. Ro uh, Rona has said, bring a manager. Absolutely, absolutely have someone who's witnessed, but also there's no problem with bringing in bigger guns. There's no problem with having the manager can handle this. That's part of their job, but it's okay to say to someone, we are happy to help you, but I need you to leave our workplace right now. We can have this conversation when you're calmer or the person you're trying to talk to is not here right now. I cannot have you continuing to throw chairs. I mean, I know that's a bit extreme, but you know, you are okay to say, I cannot have you continuing you know, to, to do that in the workplace or to do that here. I need you to leave. If you really do feel unsafe, it is okay to call security if you're in a government building or call the police, call 911 if you're in a public building. But our hope is of course that we're never gonna have to deal with a situation where someone is being violent or someone is being so abusive, we have to move them out of the workplace. But I do want you to feel empowered to know that your safety is always a priority that employee safety is always the priority. And that these de-escalation techniques are for the typical situation. And the moment that situation becomes the untypical, the unsafe, you need to think about safety and you can ask them to stop and you can ask them to leave. So I wanna talk now about what not to say to somebody. We all know there are things you shouldn't say. So I want you to go to, we're gonna make a word cloud. I want you to go to the link that you see at the top of the screen, W at the top of my slides, www.menti.com, www.menti.com. And you're gonna put in this code, this numeric code you see at the top of the slides. And then I want you to answer the question, what should you not say when you're trying to deescalate somebody? We'll give it a sec for folks to get in. Absolutely. Calm down. Relax. These are great. Just listen. Chill. Look, chill out, lady. Listen here, chill out. You're being irrational. This is not a big deal. I'm just the messenger. Why are you so upset? Others have it worse. As much as these are things that you might feel in your chest, you want to say to them. And as much as those might be correct statements, you know, this is not a big deal. This is not a life or death situation that's not going to de-escalate the situation in front of you. We're not aiming to de-escalate because we think somebody having a, 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 an escalated moment in our workplace or losing it in our workplace or having a temper tantrum in our workplace is okay. We're de-escalating because we need them to stop doing that. So this is great. Who do you think you are? Absolutely, don't say that to them. 
You're being dramatic. You're lying. Absolutely. God, there's no statement in our culture that's more dangerous or scary than someone. Are you calm? Listen to me. Are you done? Relax, buddy. These are great. And the point of a word map is that the, the, the answer that is there the most commonly is the answers that are the biggest. So calm down, relax, not my problem, are the ones that we're hearing the most from the, from the responses today, which is amazing. These are all things that you want to not say to someone who is escalated. Because again, like I said, it's not that you don't necessarily believe some of these things. It's not that you don't necessarily think some of these things are true. What you're trying to do is calm the situation down. And in order to do that, you have to listen and use active and, and good listening skills. You can say these kinds of things. You can't accuse them. You need to get them down that escalation scale. Je ne suis qu'un bénévole. That is so great. That is, I'm only a volunteer. There's gotta be folks on here. There's probably folks on here that are nonprofits. How do you say to someone like, are you kidding me? I'm here to raise money for dogs. Why are you yelling at me? Yesterday I went and got dippy dogs at the Frex, which I'm pointing that way because it's two blocks from my house. I got dippy dogs at the Frex for supper. Can you imagine if someone was losing it on one of those lovely older adults who volunteer for the dippy dog stand? I don't have time for this. These are great. These are great. These are the kinds of things you want to keep from saying when you're trying to get through that calm phase with someone. Now, the next phase, after you've gotten them down, the calming, you know, into the de-escalation portion of the escalated scale, once you've got them calmed down, that's when you can go into assess, which is when you figure out what the options are for resolving their situation or resolving the problem. Now, what happens if you go into the assess stage and they re-escalate? What happens if you move too quickly into assess? I mean, the reality of that interaction is that they don't know that you're following a step process. They don't know that you've moved into the assess phase. So if you try to move into giving them options or talking about the various possible options for resolution and they go back up, they escalate again, you say, okay, I need to go back there. I need to go back to calm. And you need to re, uh, start using your calming skills again, keeping yourself calm, you know, keeping your body language neutral, using your listening skills. Exactly. Paul has said step back to basics. Absolutely. If you get to assess and they go back to escalated, you go back to calm. The final step with them is resolve. This is when you want to put into action the solution that you two have decided on for the situation. Now, I barely talked about assessing resolve here because I want us to have time to have some questions. But I am going to be giving this training in a fuller version. Um, I have to admit, I can't, I, I don't know yet if it's a two hour version or a three hour version, but plenty later in September. You're welcome to either contact me about it or contact LearnSphere, who is the, the group that I get trained through. Um, and on their website, I can put in the chat uh, when I'm done this, this session. But if you are interested in learning more about assess or resolve, or if you're interested in some exercises and some um, uh, more talking about and work around those calming skills, that'll be in the training I give back in September. So I want you to, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to, Stop sharing my screen so we can see Angela. And I want to ask, are there any questions from the group? I know I've gone through all of that pretty quickly. Thanks for your presentation, Nicole. And uh, we have about another 10, 15 minutes together, folks, for this presentation. So really encouraging you um, to reach out to Nicole who has expertise in workplace conflict management. And if you have questions, please put them directly into the Q&A section. Alors, t'es invité à mettre vos questions dans la section questions et réponses. 
and please participate in the language of your choice. S'il vous plaît, participez dans la langue de votre choix. You know, one thing I was thinking about this morning, Angela, as I was preparing for this presentation is, of course, today's presentation was about calming down, de-escalating customers and clients, but these are also skills that can be used with your employees or with your coworkers, if you're dealing with escalated coworkers or employees as well. Great. Well, I see some questions popping in already, Nicole. Ask and away. Uh, one, of the, one of the first questions is, could we get a copy of the presentation? Absolutely, not a problem at all. Um, I can put it in the chat now, but it won't have um, the word map in it. So I will do that as soon as I'm done. Okay, thanks, Nicole. Or maybe I'll save it with the word map and send it along. And along with that, folks are also looking um, uh, for your contact information, for further information, for further sessions. Absolutely, I can share my screen again with my Okay. And I'll just leave that up while we chat. Okay. Um, earlier on the presentation, I think you were asking for some feedback back from folks in the chat, and someone had mentioned, uh, Tu n'es pas dans mes souliers. You're not in my shoes. So um, that was an interesting um, sharing as well. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I think that, you know, we often say, we don't know what someone else is going through. We don't know what their experience is. And we don't, we don't know what it is that's happened that day for them that's led them to have this reaction. Um, it doesn't make it right for them to be yelling us, at us in our workplace if that's what's happening. But nonetheless, we're, we're managing whatever else is going on in their life. Um, so we do have some more questions coming in. And um, Nicole, how do you use the body language step of calm when you are de-escalating over the phone? One thing that I would say is you want to think more about your voice and your tone of voice when you're over the phone. I also am a big believer in um, the fact that your body language does translate in your tone of voice over the phone. I've done a lot of conflict coaching with clients over the phone. And I try to be very focused and very relaxed when I'm doing that because I think that that translates into the way that I'm interacting with them. But when you're over the phone, you're going to want to focus primarily on your tone of voice and you're going to want to, and your volume of your voice, and you're going to want to focus on your listening skills. Okay. That listen, listen, listen. I remember you saying that that was a big part of the magic in conflict management. I'm telling you, it's the magic wand. I know Angela does conflict management work too, and I'm sure she agrees. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, and then we have another question. What should one do when the individual continues talking, complaining for too long of a duration, and you need to redirect end the conversation so you can resume work or continue forward with the conversation? Well, I think that's a bit of a, a bit depends on the situation. If you have a client in front of you who you can't seem to calm down or they, they might be calm, but they can't, you can't seem to move them into the next step of assess and resolve. And they're not necessarily being abusive or violent. It's not that you need to ask them to leave. You just can't get them to move with you. It depends if they're a customer that you need to keep, if they're a really important customer, you want to stay with them in that. If um, they're a really important customer and they're continuing, 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 maybe you haven't tr truly understood the problem yet. That's frustrating, I know, but it might be that you haven't fully understood the problem and that's why they keep talking around it to you. Um, if it is someone that is um, a customer or client that's sort of a one time, you one rule, general rule I tend to use is if I've gotten them calm down, and I've heard their story and they cycle back to the beginning of their story again. And I start to hear the same story starting over again. They've cycled back. Then I might interrupt gently and politely and move towards assess and resolve. I might take control of that conversation. If it is someone who is continuing and continuing and continuing, one thing you can do, even if you know the answer to the, to the problem now, you can say to them, I need to look into this, but I will get back to you tomorrow. 
as a way of transitioning that conversation to an end. Um, but you do have to get back to them. You do have to then follow up on that commitment to get back to them with a resolution. So those are three things I would suggest to try. Okay. Thank you. And I, I just wanted to mention too, I know someone that had the question about um, um, the presentations, but just a reminder that the sessions are being recorded mm -hmm. and they will eventually be posted on MMFC's um, website for viewing. So that that's might be helpful point. as well for folks. Yeah, that's a great point. So then are there any calming techniques when you calm, um, when your calm reaction appears to be setting off the person even more? I think if you're, you want to be really honest with yourself um, and you want to be really reflective. So is your calming actually condescending? You know, you want to be careful about that. Are you moving into condescension? Are you talking down to that person? Are you dismissing that person's feelings? Um, if you find that you are being respectful, polite, calming, and they're getting higher escalated, again, that is one of those situations where you might have to end that interaction. We can't calm everyone down. We can't stop or de-escalate everything. It's just human beings. We don't know what's going on with them. You know, we don't know what's causing them to be more escalated. And if so, if you if you really reflect and know that you're doing as polite and as calm and as appropriate a job as you can, and they're still escalating, that's when you might want to say, I want to help you, but I can't keep helping you if you continue to swear at me. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, I really want to have this conversation with you, but I can't have this conversation with you if you continue to get into my personal space. And maybe that's when you again have to say, uh, if they continue to do it, I've told you I can't have this conversation with you if you're going to keep swearing at me. I would like you, you know, you're going to have to leave the, the store. How about I call you tomorrow when we talk about it? Or you're going to, I'm going to have to hang up on you, but I will call you back this afternoon so we can talk about it. Or if, if it's a call center and you don't have their phone number, I have to hang up on you now because you're continuing to swear at me, but I'd like you to call us back when you're calmer so we can help with this situation. That might not de-escalate the situation, that might make them angrier, but again, you have to find that spot between calming them down and de-escalating and knowing that you can't always de-escalate everything and thinking of your safety. Thank you. Um... When in a working relationship with this person, how do you repair, help avoid escalation like this? Hmm. So do you, uh, is that a question around um, if the situation has been getting more and more tense and you're trying to avoid that kind of escalation? And I'm wondering if it might be referring uh, colleague to colleague. So uh, when working, when in a working oh. relationship with this person. I think if you had a situation where your colleague has um, escalated on you, they've lost it, they've yelled. I think if you feel safe or comfortable talking to them, because it's not okay, right? Even if it happens, we understand it happens. It's not okay for your colleague to yell at you. Um, so if you feel safe or comfortable to do so, wait till it's you know calmer in a day or two days and say to them, look, that happened on Monday. Can we talk about it? I don't want that to happen again. You don't want that to happen again. What was going on there? What led to that? How can we change the situation? If you're trying to repair, if you've escalated on someone, then you want to go and apologize and you want to try to make sure you're not doing that in the workplace. If the situation is getting tense and you're worried someone's going to lose it at work, I mean, we've all gone through in a particularly stressful two years and everyone's coming back into the workplace and there's lots of stress going on. If the situation is tense between you and a coworker and you think there's gonna be an escalation, if you feel safe and comfortable to do so, I would say, talk to them now. Find a private, quiet, neutral space and say, look, obviously there's some tension here. I want our working relationship to be really great, to be functional, effective. What's going on? How can we fix it? How are you? If you do not feel safe or comfortable. I don't know if you guys have noticed, I keep saying if you feel safe or comfortable to do so. If you are experiencing someone yelling, someone losing it in the workplace, and you don't feel safe or comfortable to tell them yourself that you'd like it to stop, 
that is potentially harassing behavior and you're absolutely within your rights to talk to your management. Okay. So I hope that that helped clarify that around that piece and, and there was reference to a long-term working relationship is what the individual highlighted. And then we have Paul that said, thank you for the response that you had provided. Um, and uh, we have another question here in the Q&A. So email complaints may not contain the full situation and are easily misunderstood. So a bit of a comment, but any commentary from you all around email complaints? It's funny, I was thinking of that. Um, I, I don't know how many of you guys watch TikTok, but there's a, a whole TikTok brand of TikTok videos that are um, online companies commenting on, on the craziest, most sort of escalated emails they get or complaints they get from customers. And so it makes me think about how you handle those situations. So of course, you might want to try, um, you know, using that, those good listening techniques or those good what to say techniques in your email. But I would say, if possible, ask that person to have a call. And it might not be possible, um, but if it is possible, ask that person to have a phone call with you. And if it's not possible, I would say go with the what to say and, and write yourself a bit of a, a bit of a format email. You know, every time someone complains, you start with the apology, you say, um, you know, here's our commitment to excellence in our service, here's what we're gonna do to fix it. We're so sorry you had this experience. And we have another question here in the Q&A. So once the situation has been resolved, what should a person do to process the experience and prevent any lingering frustration from impacting further interactions throughout the day? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? One of the things that we talk about in this, when we talk about you staying calm is, you are going to be having or might be having a fight, flight or freeze response in the moment, right? And you might be kind of faking that you're calm, even if you're feeling it inside because you need to de-escalate the situation. I would say if you're a manager, you want to, and it's an employee who's experienced that, you want to follow up with that employee, sit down with them, say like, how are you? Are you okay? How is that? How are you feeling about that? Um, if you're an employee and you don't have someone you can, you know, you can go talk to your manager about it. I would say it's important to talk it out. It's important to acknowledge, look, I'm still feeling a bit shaken up by that. People are gonna react differently to these situations. Some people might feel totally fine after being yelled at by a client and some people it might wreck them all day. I would say, accept whatever your response is. Don't judge yourself if you're bothered by it. Don't judge yourself if it makes you emotional. If you need to take a break from the workplace, if you need to go take your 15 or take your lunch, if you need to have a cry, that's okay. That's your body letting up some of that stress. Mm -hmm. I would say the important thing is don't judge yourself about your reaction. Be aware of what your reaction is. Talk it out with your manager or a colleague. Give yourself some time to, to, to let it out. Yeah. And Nicole, if you're open to taking one last question, I know there's a few questions that popped up in the chat. Um, so I was addressing questions in the Q&A first, yeah. so I apologize that we didn't get to all the questions in the chat today. Um, so what's the best approach to de-escalate someone who's expecting a resolution that you cannot accommodate, therefore making them angrier? Well, if you get into a sass and you realize that you can't give them what they want and they've gone back into escalation, right? First of all, you calm them back down again. And that might mean having to be acknowledging their feelings of disappointment that they can't have the resolution they want. One of the options then once you bring them back to calm is you have to say, okay, the options for resolution are A, B, and C. Which of those do you think, which of those would you like? You know, you maybe can't give them all their money back, but you can do something else. You can do sort of credit. You can give them a new item. You, there's, there's a lot of times there's two or three different things that you can do. So if they are angry that you can't give them what they've asked for, what they want, use your calming skills to calm them back down, to de-escalate them again, even if it means having to acknowledge their own anger at you. I understand that you're angry at this. I understand that that's disappointing. I really hear that that's frustrating for you. And then you give them the options and let them pick from the options that are available. Because even if it's not the one they wanted, if they get to pick from an option, it gives them a little bit of sense of control over it. 
And if they're stuck, if they're stuck on what they want and you cannot do that for them and you're going through this up and down, that's when you might have to say, I cannot make that happen for you. Maybe it's time we get a manager involved. Okay, wonderful. Nicole, we thank you so much for your offer of time today. So not only are you a presenter, also co-chair of the Workplace Violence <laughs> and Abuse Research Team and uh, coordinator extraordinaire in bringing oh. this event together. So thank you so much.